University in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies. She obtained her PhD in uh, the Economics of Education from Stanford University in 1989. And before she worked at Indiana University, she worked at RAND uh, as an economist and at uh, Michigan State University as an assistant professor. And she's here today to talk about her work funded by the Institute of Education Sciences on value added model. So we're pleased to have her. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I want to say that I love an interactive uh, type of forum, so you know, please uh, you feel free with questions, comments, or, as we go along. Um, this is on value by the following um, with respect to teacher performance, and it's joint work with uh, there are two other PIs, Mark Reekes, who's an assessment person, and Jeffrey Warbridge, who's an econometrician. And then we have a lot of um, graduate assistants on the project as well. And it is supported by IES. Okay, so um, you probably already know what value-added models are. They're just statistical models to, you know, to, that are intended to capture the contribution of an input, some sort of an input, uh, to student achievement. I tend to speak in economic jargon, so I'll say input. But, um, and uh, they always rely on standardized test scores. There's, there's always some way of adjusting or controlling for higher achievement. Um, and you can use them to estimate the effectiveness of all sorts of things, teaching practices, schools, programs, etc. But we're going to concentrate on using them for the purpose of estimating teacher effectiveness in this, this study. Okay, so the basic idea is you kind of want to compute the average amount of learning gain uh, for students in a particular teacher's class that, that's due to the teacher. And, you know, intuitively, it makes much more sense to think of average learning gain than just average test scores at the end of the year that, you know, after a teacher has had a class because, um, you know, obviously some teachers just have high performance students and some <coughs> teachers have lower performance students. So, but they so try to look at the learning gains puts them, puts them on a little bit more equal footing. Now, this whole enterprise has been increasing in popularity in, in line with the philosophy of the accountability movement. Uh, the race to the top competitions promoted the use of student test scores as a component of teacher evaluation. So basically when states and districts had to submit their plans for race to the top fund, they were asked, Larry, <laughs> uh, they were asked to include um, some sort of student performance measure as part of the teacher evaluation. So many states and districts rushed to comply in order to compete for race to the top funds. Um, in Michigan, where I was before, before race to the top, there was actually a law against linking teachers, teacher records to student records, and they, they repealed that law uh, in order to apply for the race to the top funds. And that happened all across the country. An interesting, I think, policy approach to create this kind of competition. It actually uh, resulted in a lot of changes for a relatively small amount of money. I mean, ended up just giving the funds to you know, few states or districts. And according to this report that came out by the Gwyn a couple weeks ago, at least 43 states now require annual teacher evaluations, and um, 32 of those incorporate student performance measures. So, as you probably know, the applications of value-added have been sparked in controversy. It was a big point of contention in the Chicago teacher strike. In the end, um, Ron Emanuel gave in a little bit, and I think he reduced the, they, they he did achieve um, getting student performance measures as part of teacher evaluation, but they reduced the weight of it to, I think, 30%. Um, public releases of value-added anger teachers and unions, uh, the LA Times, <coughs> as you may know, published measures for um, LAUSD teachers in grades 3 to 5 uh, since 2010. And in New York City, after a lot of calls, etc., and the Wall Street Journal now has published measures uh, for grades 4 through 8 online. And I'll show you. This is, an all, this is an example of the Wall Street Journal release that I just took a picture of. I just, I looked this up, I put in Robert Smith, I got Robert Smithberg, 
and he is rated as average in sixth grade math and below average in sixth grade English. So, and then closer to home for all of you here, um, here's the LA Times, what it, what it looks like, the, the web thing. So I put in Jane Smith and I got Janet Smith. And, um, you know, poor Janet is on the cusp between least effective and less effective here. Is this on the LA Times website? What's the what's the home for this data? Yeah, I have it. Let's see. This is the website right here, LATimes.com, mm -hmm. news, local, and then it's kind of like you can just you know, look up a particular teacher's name. Yeah, so I mean, it, it is something to scary, you know, it's a little scary <laughs> thing. Particularly, I mean, so I mean, I think there was. Reportedly, a case of a teacher who committed suicide after the LA Times ratings came out, just feeding into his depression, you know, feeling he was working really hard and he got rated as an ineffective teacher. Like, I mean, what? Yeah. What is less effective? What is that? I mean, what is that based? What is that based on? So basically, what they're doing is they're computing like a numerical value added score, and they're kind of just dividing it up in quintiles. Oh, okay. So he's you know got sort of the bottom twenty percent. Oh, okay. Okay, so why do this? Well, the advocates claim that value-added based measures, they're data-driven, so therefore they're objective. Um, they're better than the previous system. The old status quo was teachers being rewarded on the basis of experience <coughs> and education. Some people say that these value-added measures can supplement and maybe better than other alternatives. So, for example, there's a big push right now <coughs> towards um, implementing a lot more classroom observation of teachers than, than it, there used to be. So it used to be principals might go in once or twice during the year. Now, you know, they're, they're sending principals into classrooms to observe teachers many more times. Uh, or sometimes they'll bring in external evaluators to observe teachers. Now, if, you, if you've read the most recent MET report on this, um, these observations may be, they don't, their reliabilities are not that high. So um, they're not like the panacea either. <coughs> and they are particularly good at picking up things like classroom management, whether or not a teacher can keep discipline in the classroom, um, which is what I would say is uh, like a non-cognitive skill, but they're, they're good at picking up um, whether or not teachers can keep behaviors in line. And they may not be as good at picking up like cognitive skills, like how much you actually learn about a subject. So anyway, um, the other, another pro uh, reason that people might uh, be in favor of value that is that they may, they're more economical, right? The, you know, classroom observations are time consuming and costly. Um, the NCLB has made test scores ubiquitous, so now they're all there. So as long as we have the linkages between teachers and students, we can compute them relatively cheaply. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Yeah. Are the New York and the um, LA models, mm -hmm. they're different models? In other words. They're a little different, yeah. yeah. They're a little different. But not, not substantively Um. Well, you know, what I'm, so my, I study the, you know, the models and yeah. I think both of them have different bells and whistles, and yeah. I'm not particularly happy with either one. I mean, I don't think that they're the optimal model in either case, uh -huh. but they're a little different. Yeah, but they're, they're, he there's heterogeneity in terms of the, mod the models that they're adopted by cities. Absolutely, okay. and that's a big focus of our work, is okay. looking at what are the different kinds of models, how well do they perform, and you know which ones are better than others. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and then another really quick question. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. This is great. I just, um, are you going to talk also about um, people have been raising some methodological concerns about value added? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a, right. And are you going to talk about those? Yes. Okay, great. Absolutely. I mean, that is the, really the main focus. Oh, great. It's okay. kind of more introductory here. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, so the, the, the sort of con side for value added, you know, why, why shouldn't we use them? Well, like people might say they're biased. Um, they think they contain a lot of error, so they're very imprecise. <coughs> they're based on tests that are themselves questionable, or they could be bad for teaching morale. Okay, so what I want to do is outline the methodological concerns rated, 
related to MAP, so basically, you know, the methodological piece of this, and, and um, provide an overview of a couple of current approaches to MAP, obviously, in this forum, this time frame, I can't go through a whole lot. Um, and then I want to highlight a few of the things that are still missing in our understanding of these models. So three primary methodological concerns are the quality of the assessments, <clears throat> the quality of the data, and bias due to non-random assignment of students to teachers. All right, so the assessments. First of all, the main question, you know, the first question you might want to ask is, do the assessments test what we want the students to learn? So, you know, do they capture the breadth of knowledge that we're interested in? First of all, on these tests, they're limited in the number of items they can subject the students to. Uh, so does that mean they're sacrificing breadth in some way? And there are some ways they're trying to get around it now going towards computerized adaptive testing. So we'll see where that goes. Um, and then there's the type of knowledge. Do they rely on you know, rote memorization or are they actually getting at critical thinking? Do they capture non-cognitive skills such as behaviors for success? Well, maybe not. Um, another question is, do they align with the curriculum taught? So if teachers are going to have to teach the test to do well on value added. Does the curriculum support doing this? And then, is there considerable measurement error in the tests? And I'm going to circle back to that at the very end of this talk, measurement error discussion. Data quality, there's the issue of linkages between students and teachers. So many state systems don't have good linkages right now, and they're still struggling to put those in place. Um, and then, of course, inaccurate matching. You, know, you don't want to be rated as a teacher on somebody else's <coughs> students. So. Uh, another really important issue that's not talked about really as much as it should be is this issue of the sample size. I mean, we don't have that many students per teacher. And as you all know, in statistics, we want large samples, right? You know, we have these like, small samples of 20 people. Um, so, you know, these value-added based measures can be extremely noisy, very imprecise, if only a small number of students are contributing to, to a teacher's effectiveness score. Now, one thing you can do, and a lot of places will do this, is they'll just kind of average the teacher's effectiveness over a number of years. So they'll maybe, you know, take five years worth of data or something, and we'll have some teachers in there for longer, and they, they'll just get a score based on their sort of overall performance across the time. Problem is, though, you know, not all teachers are going to have a long track record. So there's a little bit of differential treatment of teachers based on the amount of experience they have teaching. Okay, this, then here's the other big issue, non-random assignments. So <coughs> first of all, there are a number of reasons why a teacher's students might show high growth. Well, the reason we're hoping for is that it's because it's a good teacher. Now, it could also be that the teacher just teaches more effectively to the test. There could be good teachers, but we're just teaching things that are not tested. Um, and of course, you know, the reform itself, being held accountable to, uh, by, by means of value add, is going to make teachers teach more to the test. Which isn't so bad if, we want, if the tests are really what we want the students to learn. So. Now, then there are, but also it could be that just some teachers have better resources than others. Um, some have students with more involved parents. Uh, some have classes with faster learners. And these kinds of reasons here would be much less of an issue if students were just randomly assigned to teachers. Because that way a teacher would be bound to have a few fast learners, a few slow learners, etc. But we know that, or we suspect at least, that principals assign teachers um, to students in, in purposeful ways. So first of all, they often group students in the classroom based on their ability. Um, you know, their prior test scores or whatever. And they may also match classrooms to teachers on the basis of the teacher skills. So in other words, I have a classroom of high performing students, I'm going to match that classroom to my best teachers. Or maybe um, have it the other way, the lower performing students I'm going to match to my best teachers because I want to make sure those students have a chance to do better. Yeah. Is it possible to control for parents taking the kids to Kumon or things like that, that they are like additional drilling pro programs to, 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 support the, to support the students in math? So yeah. like, 
I, like I don't see any of that listed, and you see like really motivated parents, right? Right. Right. Either paying people or yeah, yeah. So this is a big problem. We're going to talk about it like at the end a lot. Okay. Um, but you know, basically the controls you have are the things you have in administrative data sets. You've got you know race, gender, um, special needs, English language learner, and free and reduced lunch eligibility. So if you think it's related to, you know, free and reduced lunch eligibility is probably the best thing you have in terms of income. And if you think that parental interventions are related to income, then that's kind of, you're kind of relying on that. Um, and are you pretty convinced that, that this kind of non-random assignment, assignment causes bias? It definitely causes bias. But you can deal with it in some, in mm -hmm. some ways. We'll talk about that when we get to the, the models. But there's also non-random assignment to schools, right? So right. is there a way that you also, because I'm, I'm thinking about other reasons right. teacher students might show high growth, so maybe better resources is sort of just about the school in yeah. general. And, right, right. But are there ways that you're that you're also controlling for factoring in like, well, the school? The problem is, yeah, so that's a really good question. So the problem is, so you can put in school fixed effects. I don't know, does that terminology mean something to you? Okay. So you can put in school fixed effects, but the problem is once you do that, you're actually looking at a te teacher's effectiveness within a school. So compared with other teachers within the school. So then you no longer can say, this teacher in school A is better than this teacher in school B, even if that person's value added comes in higher. So it just may, so it kind of from a policy standpoint, generally they like to apply these measures models to entire districts to look at which are the most effective teachers within a district. Mm -hmm. So you can do that, but you know, just put in school effects. Otherwise, if you know a lot about schools, you can put in school level variables, right. but it's going to be hard to get like measures of resources or you know great leadership or mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So it's a tricky problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's look at the theory. Here come a couple of equations. Um, so basically the underlying theory is that there's a general cumulative effects model um, underlying this. So basically all it means is that all the relevant past experiences and current experiences that are contributing to the are, you know, are factors. So basically say, so if this AIT is achievement of child I at time P, then then it's some function, some very flexible function that we have not specified here, of educational inputs, child and family inputs here that are time varying, some sort of maybe fixed child effect, and I don't know if you've been talking about those, those kinds of models that have like a fixed child effect in there. So it would be something like, something that doesn't vary over time, like some kind of an ability thing, or a motivational thing, or maybe a disability um, that's a permanent one. And then, you know, we throw in this for, uh, to represent time varying unobserved factors. Now, however, you can't estimate that, right, because we don't know what the functional form is. I mean, it's just this, you know, it's just a concept, really. So, to estimate it, you got to start assuming linearity. You assume that the functional form doesn't vary over time. So, the same functional form that applies to fifth grade applies to third grade, et cetera. You've got to assume that the effect of all past inputs decay <coughs> at a very constant rate lambda over time. This is called the geometric distributed lag assumption. It's like saying that um, last year's, what you learned last year kind of like decays, you kind of forget it or whatever, um, at the same rate this year as what you learned last the year, two years ago, decayed for last year. So it's like the same rate of decay every year. Um, and then it assumes that the time constant unobserved, unobserved individual factor CI, that sort of ability thing, has the same impact on learning at every time period. Um, it often assumes that there are no interactions between teachers and students. I mean, a couple of people have attempted to put in interactions. So, I mean, this is a big issue, right? Some teachers might teach certain kinds of students really well and other kinds of students not so well. But we're just kind of like saying, we just want to measure how they teach with kind of an average class. So we make a lot of simplifications of all of these models 
people, um, people experimenting or trying to address address some of the other go back to the other slide. The other things that you This one? Three. So have people tried to address these kinds of things? So I mean, yeah, I mean you could do, for example, I mean there there were older studies that looked at like say like summer brain drain mm -hmm. sort of thing. And that certain pop subpopulations of students have a bigger summer, summer brain drain than others, right? Maybe they don't have as much educational support to the family going on all summer long. So yeah, I mean, you could you could theoretically interact the prior test scores or something with um, certain student characteristics. Um, so you can do things like that, but very few people actually do. So um, yeah. These models become very, very silly. Um, anyway, so if you apply all those assumptions that I just met, mentioned, then you get the following equation that probably looks familiar to you. This is the thing that people estimate. So, chief, you know, current achievement is here. So it's basically what we're talking about current achievement. We're talking about achievement at the end of the year that the teacher has had the class, which is another problem too, because a lot of times the teachers are really they test them like maybe in April or May or March or something. So, but you know, think about it like in a cleaner situation where they actually tested the, the kids at the end, the very end of the year after the teacher has had the students. So then you're controlling for prior achievement here, so last year's achievement score. And then you've got your set of educational inputs here, um, and you've got your family inputs. And so you can now estimate this with those assumptions, particularly that geometric distributed lag assumption. You can estimate this without any measures of past inputs. So you're, the least you can do it. You just need current and prior achievement, these kinds of schooling variables, educational variables. And in the, so in the teacher effectiveness value added, what are the variables we want? <coughs> well, we want teacher dummy variables or some kind of met teacher variable as an exposure to particular teachers. Some kind of a variable ID different teachers here. Okay, um, all right, so you have lots and lots of methodological, I mean, there's a whole big bag of tricks that you can pull from here to estimate that. So you can do things like these gain score equation versus that lag score equation. You can do random versus fixed teacher effects and panel versus cross section. You can use teacher indicators versus exposure variables. Um, can include or not include student demographics. Some people argue against including dem student demographics. You can use instrumental variables, you can shrink the estimates, um, pull people out of the tails back towards the average. You can use empirical bays, which is basically like your HLM. Um, they put HLM specifically on here, but this would be basically the, the equivalent here, which does have a shrinkage feature to it. Um, you can use Bayesian methods, and you can use growth percentile models, which are becoming very popular. All the stuff you can do, I'm obviously not going to have time to talk about all those. So I'm just going to talk about something very basic here, but I think it's something that's so basic that for some reason it gets ignored a lot in the literature. Um, so basically, simple approach. Just regress current test scores on prior test scores, put in a bunch of teacher dummy variables, Throw in some student demographics as controls, what you've got, for your reduced lunch eligibility, et cetera. Um, and then the coefficients on the teacher indicator variables, I'm just assuming we're suppressing the constant here right now. So the coefficient on the teacher indicator variables are the estimates of the teacher effectiveness. Are we getting on board with that? So basically, we're just putting in teacher dummies and we're going to just see, you know, it doesn't matter if I have teacher one versus teacher J or you know, teacher three. This is yeah. maybe a dumb question, but how do you think who the reference category is for the teacher? I mean, well, I mean, right here I just put in the entire, I just like suppress the contract. Yeah. Not. So you could you could divert, divert from the average. <coughs> but yeah, it is, it's, it's a little picky, annoying thing that you've got to deal with because um, you've always got to remember and add back in the constant. Right. Yeah, so. I mean, in. in Simulated data, which we like to use, is really easy. You just add back the constant, so you don't need to worry about just the reference category. But in real data, where there are teachers dropping out because of all sorts of things, it becomes a little messier. So that's a good question. 
All right, so in an equation like that, it's the same equation, when do we worry about bias? Well, we know from statistics that we worry about bias when the thing that we're interested in estimating, these betas, uh, these, these variables are correlated with something that's in the error term, right? That's left out of the regression. Okay. So if we can't just, we're not able to control for the assignment mechanism that decides who, which teacher the student is going to get. But if the assignment is based on past test scores, well then lo and behold, we do have a control right in the regression. So it's not such a big problem if assignment is based on past test scores. So that was, a, you know, it's kind of a very basic insight, but until we actually saw it in simulations, it wasn't like <coughs> as crystal clear. It's like, wow, you know, yeah. Cassie, is yeah. that assuming tracking? So it, yeah, I mean, if you didn't have tracking, you wouldn't have to worry about any bias, right? Because it'd be not, they'd be random with the assignment of students and teachers. So, but if there is tracking and it's based on past test scores, and while you're controlling for it, you're partialing out, you know, the effect of it in your data sphere. And so you've taken care of it. And do we have a good sense from the literature about what principles use in assignment? Is it just prior test scores or is it more than prior test scores? Well, we had a paper um, that we've been looking at. Um, I don't know about, you know, the literature in general, and we didn't find much. But we have a paper that where we actually look in this in data for a large state and we actually look at what are what does it look like principle for doing? Is it if you run multinomial logits for every grade year, you know, school specific combination and we look to see, you know, which teacher did got the students and is there is it uh, significantly related to prior test scores. So we can get we can get measures of whether or not students are tracked. And then we also do condition, conditional logits, we also kind of look at matching those student prior test scores and things with some teacher characteristics. So we get, we get some suggestive evidence that they're also doing a little bit of matching of students to teachers. But it's not in every school. So it was like, you know, it was more in sixth grade, um, more than 50% of schools are doing it in sixth grade, but then it was much, a little lower. But these are crude measures, right. you know, but we get some evidence of it. So, interestingly enough, there's some popular methods that don't control for the assignment mechanism. So, for example, a lot of people, although less so now, I think because we've been, I don't know, well, some of us, not our team alone, but others have been saying don't do this for now three or four years. But, so, you know, the gain score for regressions were very popular. So, just instead of doing, um, regressing current scores on prior, just assume that lambda is equal one subtracted from both sides and run this regression, you no longer have prior test scores on the right hand side. So you're no longer partialing it out of these betas. Can you give us some reference? I'm just, I'm just thinking of people who have worked out there in the mm -hmm. and have been using these methods and I'm trying to put it in context. So when you say some people have been using this, what comes to mind? Well, the gain score, I mean, in terms of research, uh, I mean, I think that, you know, the Kane and Stager 2008 paper that's been cited a bazillion times does it both with gain scores and also with black scores. Um, there were a lot of, a lot of uh, papers, even work I did years ago, <laughs> you know, had gain scores in it. Um, in terms of the actual states and what they're applying, um, um, a lot of them are doing very different things in the growth modeling and stuff. They're more like doing these, this is the most popular thing right now, I'd say, these residual-based methods. So instead of putting in a bunch of teacher dummies, they, well, let's just not put any teacher variables in here, just regress current scores and prior and demographics, so adjust for prior test scores and general demographics, save the residuals, and then just average the residuals for the teachers, <coughs> so for each teacher. That's so. what the study does. Exactly. I have it listed right Oh, yeah. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, so the med study does that, and then they, they shrink, you know, I mean, they, a lot of them will do it and apply shrinkage to the estimates. Um, they'll do it with OLS and they'll apply shrinkage, or they'll just go straight, do a true empirical base. I mean, a lot of them call that empirical base when they do OLS and apply shrinkage, but actually, the true empirical base would be actually to do like an HLM. Um, 
So this is very popular. Now, you know, the problem is now you're not, you don't, you missed your opportunity to partial out the, the uh, effect of the prior test scores from the teacher coefficients. So you just can't do it um, when you do that method. <coughs> So what we do, well, so what we did, we set up simulations, and we showed that these gain score and residual-based methods are inferior to the lag score specification <coughs> when non-random assignment exists. So when non, when assignment to teachers is based on the prior test score, it's much better to control for the prior test score, which you don't do here, but you do here, and have the teacher variables in the same right-hand side of the regression. Which you don't have here. So, so would you like to talk to <coughs> Tom Kane and the Matt team and talk about what they're doing? Does it make sense? Because I mean, I'm, oh. I'm using those data. I'm like, I don't want to yeah. be. I'm using the value added estimates they give me, which are based yeah. on this residual based method. So now I have mm -hmm. to add like a clause that, that yeah. you know, research says it's not very good. <laughs> well, so here's one of the interesting puzzles. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not, depend, it depends on the situation, how bad it is. So what we're finding is, like, doing this is, can be, like, abysmal. Mm -hmm. Doing this only messes things up when there's the non-random assignment. So you're going to get some teachers who are going to have poor value-added estimates. So, it, yes, it, it's not the ideal thing to do. Um, one of the reasons they like to do it is because they like to throw in peer classroom averages on the right hand side. And when you do that, if you only had one year of data, you couldn't put in classroom averages and teachers dumb, teacher dummies, right? You have exact multicollinearity. So, but even if you have more than one year of data and you start doing that, you end up with these collinearity issues and it, they estimates become very imprecise. So a lot of times they just they think they're actually <coughs> getting a huge benefit by putting in those classroom variables. Um, and so they think this is a superior method. But really in simulations you can show it's just not. You, know, you can just actually demonstrate it. You know, under these conditions it's an inferior method to use. So yeah, I mean, no, I haven't talked to Doug. <laughs> not sort of the way I don't know that I'm used to. <laughs> but, um, but I'm hoping that they're going to read, you know, they read the paper. Well, it also depends on what you're trying to get at in the level of granularity. Right? I, 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 sort of I know that, I mean, I'm sort of talking back at you. You're talking to you methodologically about this. Mm -hmm. I'm following that. Yeah. Um, but it seems that part of what needs to drive all this is the question of what exactly are to measure, I and mean, at, at that level, to include classroom level variables, even if it's imperfect, of course, is, there could be a rationale. Right? Absolutely. So but when we're working on some simulations doing that, and it actually kind of screws things up. Mm -hmm. So we're still trying to figure that why the pure effects things. Pure effects are very, very tricky things to estimate. I don't know if you know that pure effects literature, but it's like, you know, it's very difficult. And there can be spurious correlations induced by putting pure effect variables in there. So we're trying to sort that piece out um, right now. Um. What, um, what method did the LA study use? So, um, so Dick Woody, the economist who did it, um, he uh, used um, a lag score specification, but he, uh, he does, oh, I think it's one of the better methods, but it's not what I would say is the best. He has, and I don't want to be quoted right now. In fact, I mean film, so I'm not. <laughs> going to say, so, <laughs> so I'm not going to say with, you know exactly what it is because I probably will get it wrong. But he has a lot of bells and whistles on his thing. He standardizes test scores and all sorts of things. It shrinks. And, um, okay, so. Back to your question, Morgan, does it, does it exist? And this is that paper I was telling you about where we looked at data, just, just we ran all those multi multi loads, these conditional loads, and everything. We do find that assignment based on prior test scores occurs in a non trivial number of schools, especially in sixth grade. Um, correlations of teacher effect estimates across the different value added approaches 
decrease in the presence of non-random assignment. Okay, so that to me tells me, well, if, the, if they're, we're getting different estimates for these teachers, depending on which approach we're using, when we're in schools that are doing a lot of this matching, then I would go with the safer approach would be to use a lag score specification and treat your teacher effects as, rip, as fixed <coughs> by putting them in as like dummy variables or something. Okay, so that's kind of like a very, very tiny little case of what's kind of going on, but I want to start talking about things that people are still are not dealing with. Um, parental responses, measurement error, size of teacher, there were all sorts of things. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple, two things right now for this particular talk. The parental response issue and the measurement error. Okay, question. Do parents respond to teachers, teacher assignments in ways that compromise value added? <coughs> so what if a child, you know, a teacher, <coughs> a parent has a child and gets what they think is a bad teacher? What's the parent going to do? Well, maybe go out and hire a tutor. So that's like a violation of what we would call contemporaneous exogeneity. So there's like a situation where we get the draw of the teacher and we immediately do something that's not controlled for that's responding to the teacher assignment. This could be a problem. Now, there are reasons to believe it may not be that big of a problem. So it might be that parents with more means, wealthier parents, just supplement education regardless of whether the teacher is good or bad or whatever. I think a lot of times parents will hire a tutor if their kid flunks a test. But it doesn't mean the teacher's bad. So it's not necessarily so tied to teacher quality that it's going to mess up the teacher quality estimate. And if we can control for parental wealth or some kind of a feature that we think is highly correlated with parents' um, behaviors in this regard, we may be controlling for some of this. But again, this is a very crude measure. It's like a dummy variable. <laughs> And, you know, it's not a really good parental income mm -hmm. measure. Um, the other thing is, parent, yeah, parental appraisal of teachers just may not be accurate. Do you really know how good your kid's teacher is? You know, what do you think, Larry? <laughs> it's hard. I mean, it's hard to imagine. They're noisy, you know, noisy estimates of teacher quality, I think, here. Now, ironically, Let's say we could get good value-added measures. Parent, you know, access to teacher value-added is going to give them something to actually react to, right? So this problem that may not be a big deal right now could potentially get worse. I'm just going to leave it there because I don't know what the answer to that is. But there's also lots of other kinds of noise that happens that could affect the teacher companies within the school. That's not just Absolutely. It just depends on whether it's non-random. Like if it's correlated to the teacher quality, then we're in trouble, right? Because you can have all sorts of factors related to achievement, but as, as long as they're not correlated to the thing we're estimating, which is those betas on the teachers, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, yeah. But as a, I mean, my initial thought was correlated with the image, just like you did. Mm -hmm. I don't know Fear is price lunch is too low a threshold or not, but we've got yeah. to decide for me because I don't have a better one. Right. If you have a school that is has summer school and extended day programs that largely get children who are struggling, who are mm -hmm. often poor, right, right. doesn't that sort of undo the whole theory behind why you have an income threshold to do this? Because you've now got yeah. the school actually interfering with the teachers. Right, right, right. Support. So you'd you want to control so, for something right, like if that. You have, if yeah. you have those, those, those data. Yeah. But nobody's doing that. I mean, yeah. nobody's controlling for these school level variables. We just don't have the data. Systems. No, I understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's that would that's that a perfect could example. Figure it out. But, no. but to me, that that it either mitigates the whole issue, or it, what would be interesting would do it in, in states that have high spending, where you're likely to see those, compared mm -hmm. to states with low spending, where you're less likely to, and see mm -hmm. if something happens. But that's that's good. Let's write a proposal. <laughs> but that's a, <laughs> but that's a, that's still kind of a shaky uh, assumption right, right. that's going to work. I mean, I, it's, well, 
Yeah, I know. Those simulations, right? I think it's just something that we need to, we haven't thought collectively about this particular problem right now. We haven't thought of ways to strengthen the models, you know, against this problem here. Um, but yeah, I mean, those are some possibilities. Okay, now I want to start with this. I want to talk a little bit about measurement error and leave you with a really intriguing puzzle that hopefully you will help me solve. Um, okay, so measurement error. So um, in econometrics, and I don't know, you probably, you know, in your class you talked about it a little bit, there's you know, this notion of classical measurement error. There's like, you have a poorly measured, poorly measured variable on the right-hand side. In this case, we're worried about test scores, prior achievement. So you have a poorly <coughs> measured variable, and if you, if it's, as long as the measurement error is just kind of random, it doesn't really, it's not, you know, worse for certain people than for others. Um, you'll just have a little attenuation bias in your coefficient and things like that, but it won't, it won't um, affect uh, things too much. Um, so, but the problem is, the IRT model, the item response theory model, how many, how many people here have studied um, IRT or assessment and stuff? Okay, so, well, okay, one person, yeah. So, um, so the IRT model is, what they do is you get a, you give kids a set of items, right, and you create, do they get it right or wrong? And then you feed all of that into this kind of a logistic model, and that will estimate the child's true achievement, you know, try to estimate this achievement forever, okay? Now, it naturally produces me measurement error that's greater at the highest and lowest ends of the achievement distribution. And that's just, it makes sense because kids in the middle, the tests are probably pretty good at testing. Because they're, you know, the target kind of items and things, there are probably a lot of items or kind of average. There just may not be enough to differentiate kids at the ends of the spectrum too easily. So. So we have this issue where there's measurement error that's what we would say was heteroscedastic. So it is different at different parts of the achievement distribution. Okay? Now the question is how does this play out for teachers with high or low performing students? Well, this paper that we just uh, completed a draft of, we look at administrative data, so actual data, no simulations here, and we're teaching, we're finding that teachers who teach certain groups of students have value-added scores that are less stable over time. <clears throat> so teachers of low-achieving students, their scores fluctuate a lot from year to year, more so than teachers of like average achieving students. So maybe heteroscedastic measurement error is one of the problems here. There could also just be that teachers of low-achieving students just bounce around more, but I have a hard time finding a theoretical reason for that. Dumb question. Yeah. Um, no questions. Are no questions. Um, <laughs> uh, how about students bouncing around? Well, they definitely are. The low achieving yes. students are more, they have more variability. They're huge. Yeah. I mean, that, that we know that. Yeah. The but that's the, that's the essence <clears throat> of it. And we just yeah. get, we have more errors in these, that yeah. part of the distribution. Okay. It's the, it's the essential issue here. Minority students also show, even when you control for achievement level, we're showing that those teachers have less stability in their. I think that ask so tell me about this stuff. But what, I mean, what of these issues are you know, particularly salient to the value added model, and what of these issues are just things that we've been, you know, we can kind of map that out? But mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your take on it. Uh, so are, which are things are really that, important? And, and which, which are just endemic and, and things that we continue to struggle with? And, right. And we, and we, and we, and we, that, that would be the question I might ask. You. Well, we're, right now what we're doing is working with simulations here on this measurement error. Because this is one of the areas where I'm still like worried on the measurement error um, piece of this. And let me show you why. And then maybe we'll have that discussion, which is more of a synthesis at the end. I've only got a couple more slides here. Okay, so in the simulations, we're saying the preliminary results show that there can be bias in the pre presence of this heteroscedastic measurement error. Ceiling and floor effect obviously can exacerbate the problem, right? So if your tests have really heavy ceiling and floor effects, you're going to have an even worse problem, right? Because the ends of the spectrum are not being fleshed out. 
existing techniques, so there are like the New York methods, they have a variance correction model. Um, these particular techniques to correct the measurement error are always based on a classical measurement error assumption, so that random measurement error assumption. They don't really work so far in what we're seeing in our simulations. In principle, a computer adaptive test would solve the problem. That's what I'm thinking that it might help a lot. But I don't know yet, you know. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're playing around with ceiling and floor effects mm -hmm. in our simulation. We've got a really clever way of simulating observed test score data from like a true anyway. But um, so so let's look at this. So this is this is just like a thought experiment we've done. We've actually created a data set with 16 teachers in it. And the teachers have absolutely no effect on achievement. None of them. No teacher has any effect on achievement. So it's all zero. And what we're doing is we're sorting the students, though, based on their prior achievement. So the low, lowest performing classroom is going to be number one, and 16 is going to have the highest performing students. Okay, and then it's going to just go on a trajectory of, you know, monotonic sort of progression towards the highest performing classroom. So the students are sorted, the teachers all, all have zero effect. Okay? So when we use our OLS lag, and, we, and in a case where we have, we have no measurement error in our test scores, and we use our lag score specification, and we run our replications of the simulation 100 times, and we get estimates of teacher 16 value added 100 times. So we have 100 estimates, and we plot the box plot of the distribution of those estimates for that teacher. With me? Mm -hmm. OK. So this looks pretty good. Everything's coming in around zero. That's the median in the middle line. The interquartile range is, you know, pretty much the same across the board. So this one I'm not worried about. No, no measurement error on the test scores. The, the gain score model is terrible because it's actually showing that the teacher with the lowest performing students is a better teacher. And the and the math, the method of averaging the residuals would be somewhere in between those. Um, it probably goes the other way. Yeah. Um, I don't have it in my head right now what that box plot looks like, but but yeah, your instinct I think is, is correct. But it, it's probably but it's, it's just going to probably go the other way from the gain score, just because the gain score what it does is it leaves this piece of current achievement. <coughs> error term and messes it up and it's got like a negative correlation with it. Yeah. Kelsey, yeah. I'm just like fascinated by this and, <coughs> and in terms of quality implications, yeah. do you know any district that have actually used like incorrect models to kind of like determine teacher pay or something? Well they like? all are. I mean right? I mean, nobody's correcting the only one the Absolutely. only models where they're correcting for measurement error are the ones where they're assuming it's classical measurement error. Nobody's doing any kind of modeling that's correcting for IRT, you know, or the ceiling floor effects. And, and, and I would say you can turn off the camera there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's that, that's not just a, the burden there, it's just not on the districts and states. It's like, oh, not, not bad districts and states. It's they lack the capacity for any of these models to, to effectively assess what are better or worse models since you're Jack well, yeah, but the districts in the states, they don't know enough about this. That's what I'm saying. And well, we they, <laughs> that's, that's that's we don't, we researchers are, you know, we're trying to flesh out, we're trying to claw away, you know, at all of the, the problems and figure this out. And, you know, the policy is leaping ahead. And, but, you know, it's the classic thing. I mean, don't think that this is unusual. This is the way policy works. So at least, Right, Larry? I mean, you know, like, the policy is like gets made before all the research is out well, generally. And, and, the, and the question I was going to ask you earlier that has anybody run multiple models of these and see how the teachers are evaluated? Well, that's what I think I mean, we should do. Yeah, I all think, four of those, yeah. just like you did there, and I took teacher A. Right. How would he or she show up? That's yeah. what I think yeah. we should do is yeah. we should not give a teacher one, we shouldn't just pick one value added model. And just say this is it, you know, which is what they all do. They just pick one. I mean, we should be running. You know, the teacher should have ten scores, value added scores to look at, and.
And then we should sort of, you know, that's what I, if I were a teacher, I'd want to know what my value add was, but I'd want to know it on all different methods. Mm -hmm. See, that's different. If I were a teacher, I'd try to teach music and PE. So you could <laughs> 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 smart teachers all put you out Except for they don't have jobs anymore. Well, you're yeah, California. <laughs> But you also have to think about what that does to the teacher trying to understand those scores. I mean, when you give them, they don't understand one model, and so then right. you give them ten, and I think that that just leads to more distrust. Just saying, I am a teacher, so I do such a scary But yes, I mean, I, I think it's it, it's a thing we need to look for. So what, what happens a lot of times people run these models and they'll come up with correlations between the two models of like 0.99 or 0.95 or whatever, and they say they're all the same. Don't worry about it. The problem is they haven't looked at individual teachers and individual teachers at different points in the distribution, mm -hmm. and they haven't like really fleshed that piece of it out. And the, some studies that have started to do that have been finding that there are some teachers who do get hurt, you know, that are sensitive. Their, their scores are sensitive. So let's just let me give you this one last slide here, one last puzzle. Now we put in the IRT-based measurement error in our test scores, okay? And even our old standby, the one that we've been endorsing all along, the lag score specification with fixed teacher bugs, is showing bias, right? Mm -hmm. So now it looks like the teacher 16 is a better teacher than teacher 15. You know. So, you know, and this one still is abysmal, um, you know, even worse. So, you know, the question is, okay, we need to understand this better. We, we need to, so we've applied the sort of standard correction techniques, one based on classical measurement error. There is actually even one by a guy named Sullivan that was, is called, it's a, a correction for um, heteroscedastic measurement error. I don't think anybody's using it in the education policy world. We try that, and that actually is really bad, too. So what we're trying to do right now is figure out, okay, in our little problem here, our simple little problem, can we undo this measurement error? Can we figure out a way to undo this particular measurement error? This, the existing methods don't undo it. They don't take out the bias here. So this is just, you know, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's cutting edge research. You know, we don't have the answers yet. Um, but I think, you know, it would be nice to know the answer to, to this problem. It's sort of, I mean, you say that sorting is, a, is an issue, but so I don't know how much sorting you put into this data set, but it's the magnitude of the sorting that you put in here similar to the magnitude of the sorting that happens in schools? Or is uh, this sort of an question. exaggerated worst case scenario? Yeah. Well, it's not, we have some noise in it, so it's not perfect sorting. Yeah. But, um, you know, again, schools are very heterogeneous right. in that respect. Some of them do a lot of sorting, and some of them don't do any, hardly any. So, and then of course, when you look at schools that don't do much sorting, um, all your value-added measures, the correlations amongst them come up very, very high. And when you look at schools that do do sorting, the correlation amongst the value-added measures comes up lower. So. I just had a question. Um, I want to understand, how are you incorporating the measurement error in your simulation here? I'm just, I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay, good I'm question. Sure did that. Yeah. All right, it's a little complicated. <laughs> so we start out with what we think, you know, simulating drawing from a normal distribution of students' true achievement scores, okay? Their true knowledge. So we have that measure. Then from that, we generate a set of items, so 50 items, so we have the students take 50 item tests, you know, fake students, and we, we um, based on their true knowledge, we generate, with a little bit of, you know, obviously there's imprecision in there, what they're likely to have responded on the items. Okay, so then we have a set of correct, incorrect, you know, for each item. We take those items, and that's what you do. That's that's where we start out, just the way a real district would do it. We take those items, we run it through the IRT model, and we produce the observed test score, and you know, what, which is correlated with the original true score, but it's not exact. So it's got it's got the error in it. So that's, you know, a puzzle, right? I personally would like to understand better. So, I mean, I think, you know, what we know so far is let's use last lag score specifications, you know, let's put teacher variables on the right-hand side. But we still need further research on the unknowns. I mean, 
The other thing that I didn't mention here was the size of teacher effects. If teacher effects are really big, it's much easier to estimate them. When they're small, they're you know it's a lot noisier. So when we did our you know our foundational paper brackets, then we use like five percent of the total variance in, in student learning gains, which comes up a lot in the literature. But we also bracket it with teachers having effect as big as twenty percent. And if the teacher effects are bigger than the methods that are good, when they're good, they do better at classifying teachers as high performing or low performing, et cetera. So that's another big thing that we don't really know. I mean, the only good data we have on that is from Tennessee Star, and those are K through three. K through three, because you need random assignment of students to teachers in order to use like an HLM model, pull off the variance components, right, and see what the teacher effect, how big it is relative to the other, the student or the school or whatever. But without random assignment, those are kind of worthless estimates. We don't have enough data on, I mean, it would be nice if everywhere we had random assignment data, we, we did this and looked carefully to see what the teacher effect was. But anyway, so that's my talk. And <laughs> welcome to ask more questions. Unfortunately, we only have a few more minutes because we're, there's a scheduling extent to it, so just a few <laughs> questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if you find that, across various models, the value added scores are all highly correlated, then would you argue that they're probably a valid measure or could they all be off in the same way? They could all be off, yeah. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I still, for me, the, the sort of one that I like the best is that lag score supposed to be shown. That's, yeah, but they could all be off. I mean, there could be a situation where teachers are, students are grouped, but not on the basis of prior test scores, but on something else. Odd. It's a little implausible, um, and that method suffers in that case. Do, do you look much at the like twice lag achievement score? Yeah, that, we, we have been looking at that. We, we, there are other. I actually didn't even list some of these things. But different, different numbers of lag, <coughs> different you know propensity score methods. Um, there are a lot of different things you can do, but nothing really. Um, adds that much, but you can clean up little things here and there. So, yeah. Are you presenting this talk to policymakers or Arne Duncan? <laughs> you know, because it seems like there's so many problems with this. Like, is our value map model as they see it now? Are they re do they? I did have one more you know. slide. What's your view? <laughs> <laughs> this is where you're supposed more to write. Like, like, it seems like there's so many. <laughs> Flaws with the models? I mean, it doesn't seem well, really. So here's the. So you know, I'm giving this talk and I'm sounding like I'm totally anti-value, and I'm not. Uh -huh. Okay. So I think it's information. I think you know we know enough about making a, a fairly decent model to compute them and look at them. I am against firing teachers on the basis of these models, which they are doing um, in places like Indiana, the state that I'm in. Um, they're like way off the scale in terms of. You know, principals have complete autonomy for all sorts of things. I mean, there's they want to abolish teacher certification. There's you know all sorts of stuff. But anyway, but they you know they're using the, the models to to our teachers. So I'm against that because I feel like there's not enough assurance that a teacher who looks like you know she's in the bottom 10 percent is really in the bottom 10 percent. And I just feel like that's an awful big risk to take in, for a person's you know. So following up on Holly's question, so we know that Doug Harris has mm -hmm. been, he wrote a book and he wrote a right, case right. report kind of advocating for value added. Is he, does he have such a critical take or is he advocating for a specific model? What's your take on that? Well, I think Doug, so I don't think any other research group has come down as strong as we have in terms of please use lag score specifications with teacher variables on, you know, it's like, because they, a lot of times they'll look at the correlations, they'll say they're high, well, and they don't know what the right model is, and they haven't done the simulations, and so they don't. So, I mean, I think Doug is pretty cautious about, say, endorsing value-added for high stakes purposes, but people are becoming more and more comfortable with it. Yeah, yeah. And so really, the is to try and translate it. Right, right. Yeah. But, I mean, Doug's message gets a little bit, because he's not like totally anti, so his message gets a little bit sort of exaggerated. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
these companies viewed as being advocates and advocacy positions. But I think he's more of an advocate the way I am. Yeah, let's do it. Let's look at them. Let's look at a bunch of them. And then sort of make decisions. Or, you know, or and, and here's the other thing. In the teacher evaluation systems now, they're often never more than 50% of the teacher evaluation. Um, sometimes they're a lot less than that. And, but again, why not use the best model? Well, why not fund this kind of research? Right. Uh, yeah, well, I guess. Yeah, so. yeah. And hopefully they'll fund a follow on grant, <laughs> which is the one that's going to talk more to policymakers. Like, let's, yeah. let's <laughs> figure out a way for policymakers to look at their system, mm -hmm. right. assess how much you know, matching and stuff there is in there, how much sorting there is. Like, <coughs> like let's kind of, you know, and check. Run it through a bunch. Of, see what's going to happen now with the consortia. You know the test, testing consortia. The, I don't know if you've heard of the, the park and the smart, whatever smart balance. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is, is the vendors are going to, um, you know, be the one. The vendors are at the table. They're going to be creating these assessments and they're going to pick a method and just say, and we'll compete your teacher value added methods oh. and automatically for you. <laughs> And so we need to be at the table with those people to say, you know, do this in the best way possible. Uh -huh. yeah. We have to go. We're covering with the one. All right, let me just answer one more question. I was just asking if do you think using VA, VAMs in tandem with classroom observations, given what you're learning about the reliability of those, is that a step in the right direction? Well, I think that's where they're moving. The problem is they're not highly correlated. Now that could be fine. It doesn't mean that one should be used to validate the other. Because, the, like I say, the classroom observation is picking up non-cognitive skills, yeah. and the test scores are picking up cognitive skills. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be met. But that's what they're doing. They're moving towards that. Principals all over this country are like, oh, I got to get in the classroom. Each teacher's classroom four, five, six times. And, you know, write, use a rubric, but it's still very hard. Thank you. Thank you.